Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Biotech Summit. Uh, I'm Addy, PhD candidate in biochemistry at University of Southern California here in Los Angeles. Biotech Connection Los Angeles, a 501c3 nonprofit aimed to connect and grow the biotech industry of Los Angeles. This is our sixth year of running the Biotech Summit. And this year, we bring the summit straight to your home in a virtual format, which we hope offers you all the elements of a real conference. As we get started with the program, I would like to present to everyone a little bit about the organization. BCLA's mission is to inspire, educate, and connect emerging scientists and entrepreneurs to grow and diversify biotech in LA. We are able to achieve this mission by the support of our core sponsors, the Bridge Institute, USC at USC, Bioscience LA, and Magnify Incubator at UCLA. Founded in 2014, um, we have been hosting events uh, since our start uh, with an average of 10 events per year um, or one event per month. And now we proudly have more than 6,500 subscribers to our monthly newsletter. Since the pandemic lockdown started in March 2020, we have hosted all our events virtually with great success and uh, thanks to the, all the audience members who keep returning to our events. I would like to thank um, the team which comprises of graduate students, undergraduates, and even high school students, postdocs, and young industry professionals who volunteer their time to bring these events to you. I want to thank everyone on the team for working tirelessly over the past many weeks um, to get this event together. Today, our program is structured um, to just like our regular summit, but is a mix of live sessions um, and pre-recorded panel videos. We will be shortly hearing from Mr. Rick Burke of Stat News and then pre-recorded panel discussions on the said topics. The most fun feature of today is the live networking roundtables from 1 to 2.30, where we have 40 mentors available for you to network with. Finally, I would like to thank our event sponsors who have made this event possible. Uh, before we get started uh, for the keynote, I would like to show share a short message from Jason Crockett of the LA's mayor office. Hello everyone, and welcome to the 2020 BCLA Biotech Summit. My name is Jason Crockett, and I'm a director of community business and oversee policy and business development for healthcare and biotech for the office of Mayor Eric Garcetti. First, I'd like to thank Biotech Connection Los Angeles for bringing us together for their annual summit, at least as together as we can be at this point. It would have been easy to use the pandemic as an excuse to cancel this event, but now more than ever, it is essential that the biotech community have places and forums to connect. For several years now, BCLA has provided such forums for our region's aspiring biotech entrepreneurs. Each year, I am more and more impressed by how they have been able to foster community on college campuses throughout Los Angeles. At the end of the day, our young talent is the greatest asset LA has to bring, and we must continue to build you all up. We can't let a little global pandemic get in the way of that. Today, you will hear from some incredible speakers, innovators, and thought leaders who are helping to chart the course for biotech's continued growth in Los Angeles. They will share their perspectives on how we can continue to advance biotech research, development, and commercialization in this region, and how we bring an equity lens to this work amidst the pandemic that has leveled inequitable devastation among low-income communities and communities of color. Indeed, COVID-19 has laid bare the, the chasms in our health systems and social safety net that many of us were aware of already, but that too few solutions and resources have been dedicated towards. The workers we have now come to loud as being essential are oftentimes the ones placed at the highest risk with the fewest means of mitigating the most devastating results caused by the pandemic. A pandemic that is killing blacks at twice the rate of whites and Latino Hispanics at nearly three times the rate as whites. is telling us much more about the circumstances we've allowed to persist 
in the decades leading up to the pandemic than the challenges we faced over the past six months. A pandemic that yields a mortality rate four times greater in our high poverty communities than in our low poverty communities speaks volumes to just how much we truly value many of those same essential workers we cheer on social media. While this pandemic has forced us to face some very real truths about ourselves, even in good old liberal Los Angeles, there have been some incredibly inspirational moments. The hospitals and medical workers who have put themselves in the front line, sacrificing their health to care for those in need. Restaurants unable to open for business, deciding instead to donate food so families don't go hungry while loved ones are unable to work. Entrepreneurs and innovators repurposing their skills and resources to answer the call for PPE, ventilators, and other critical items in short supply during the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic. The city's partnership with Curative allowed us to be the first major city in the nation to guarantee testing for anyone who wanted it during the height of the pandemic. These acts are all reflective of who we are as a community. As we look for inspiration going forward, a reason to feel hopeful that we can indeed get through this, the eyes of the nation and the world are now fixed on one place. You all are biotech and medtech innovators. People may not understand the, in and, understand the in and outs of NIH funding, but they are now hoping and praying that someone in a lab can develop a vaccine that can free us from our isolation. Few people started out 2020 familiar with the term contact tracing, but it's now front of mind for everyone. I certainly couldn't tell you what a polymerase chain reaction test was in February, but I've had four in the last two months. Amidst the chaos and confusion, LA-based companies and innovators are helping to lead the nation in, in global response. Indeed, if 2010 was defined as the rise of tech in Silicon Beach in LA, biotech is poised to be the leader in the region's post-pandemic economic resurgence across the next decade. The biotech field has the attention of the city and county in a way that it couldn't have imagined just eight months ago. In general, healthcare is front and center for all of us now. While government can certainly identify the symptoms, it is you all, the innovators, researchers, and entrepreneurs who are best able to define the underlying problems and solutions. Thank you again to BCLA for creating the space for young thought leaders in the field of biotech to gather, share ideas and inspire solutions that can benefit us all. Thank you everyone for joining this event and I'll turn it back over to Adi. Thank you. Hi, my name is Peter Emtich, Head of Kite Research, and I am long on LA. Hi, my name is John Petrovich. I'm the CEO of the Al Mann Foundation for Scientific Research, and we are long for LA. I'm Basil Dahiad. I'm the CEO at Zencore, and we're long LA. We've been long LA for 23 years, and we're going to keep on going. I'm Dina Lazowski from UCLA, and I'm long LA. I'm Dave Piaqua from Amgen, and I'm long LA. I'm Nicole Leonard at Cedar sinai and we are Long LA. My name is Abbas Yar Khan, and with Takeda, we are Long LA. I'm Ann Wellington at the Cedar sinai Accelerator, and we are Long LA. Hi, my name is Mike Guerra with California Life Sciences Association, and we are Long LA. And I'm Long LA. I'm Long LA. I'm Harlan Levine with City of Hope. I'm Linda Malkus with City of Hope, and we're Long LA. I am Kevin Zane, partner at Upfront Ventures, and we are Long LA. I'm Daniel Dwellian, and I'm Long LA. I'm Sue Wyndham Bannister, and I am Long LA. Hi, I'm Dave Whalen, the CEO of Bioscience LA, and as you guessed it, I am Long LA. Thank you to Jason and Bioscience LA for providing that video for us. Finally, I would like to welcome our keynote for the, uh, for the summit. Uh, Rick Burke oversees Stat News and co-founded it, it in 2015. He was previously a longtime reporter and editor at New York Times. 
He was a chief political correspondent there for more than a decade, and before that covered beats including Congress, the White House, media, and national drug policy. Before coming to Boston to launch STAT, he was executive editor of Politico. STAT News is part of my daily regimen and the first thing I read in the morning. And also, it became the go-to site for 30 million unique visitors in the first three months of this year alone. STAT provides us all with up-to-date biotech news and is spearheaded by the media guru, Mr. Rick Burke. Let me show you a short video of STAT commemorating its fifth anniversary and then welcome Rick. Getting hit in your head by somebody that weighs 280 pounds, my head hurt immediately. There was a report in Stat News. They use a process called genotyping. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, even if a, a COVID-19 vaccine is only 50% effective, that could be a game changer. I truly believe that what I do has the ability to reach people. You know, I got a needle in my arm and it's like, what the hell happened? Why do I love this? I realized firsthand the extraordinary capacity of technology to heal, to rehabilitate, and to extend physicality beyond natural levels. Please welcome Rick. Pleasure to have you join all the way from uh, Boston uh, and address our audiences here in LA and beyond. Adi, thank you so much for inviting me and I'm so impressed. Uh, tech, technical glitches aside, I'm so impressed with the, um, the conference you've put together and um, at, at such a trying time for all of us. Your mission, which you had stated at the outset to inspire, educate and connect emerging scientists and entrepreneurs to grow and diversify biotech in LA is very much in sync with our mission at STAT. I am of course a journalist, not a scientist, but this nightmare of a pandemic underscores the responsibility that we all have, which is to educate the broader public about science and health and drug development. As students, postdocs, professionals, I can't imagine a more vital opportunity for you than right now to find the breakthrough remedies to save lives and protect people from infectious diseases like the virus that causes COVID-19. Your determination at BCLA to make Los Angeles a major biotech hub seems achievable and realistic. The ingredients are there. We, we see in our internal metrics at STAT that there's an enormous concentration of devoted readers in the Los Angeles area. Your ambitions about biotech remind me of the origins of STAT, which on Monday begins a week-long celebration of our fifth anniversary. That, that video you showed was the first sneak preview. We just finished it on Friday, so <laughs> the first sneak preview for our fifth anniversary. Let me give you some personal history uh, that I hope will shed some light on STAT's origins and why we think, why I think what you all do is so important. Um, Adi, as you mentioned, I spent most of my career at the Times. Um, from there, I was editor of Politico and a day or so after I left Politico, I got a call from Boston. John Henry, the billionaire owner of the Red Sox, 
had bought the Boston Globe about a year earlier, and he wanted to know if I would move to Boston to start a world-class publication about the life sciences. Uh, those of you in California might, might understand my reaction. Do I want to move to frigid Boston? And perhaps more importantly, what do I know about biotech and the life sciences? That wasn't my field. Um, John explained to me what spurred his interest in created, creating this publication. In the summer of 2014, he had been invited to a dinner with Eric Schmidt, who was the executive chairman of Google, to discuss why Boston, which once had the opportunity to claim the mantle as the nation's biotech hub, had been eclipsed by Silicon Valley. The talk in that this dinner soon turned to Massachusetts' predominance in life sciences. John realized that while Cambridge and Boston were an epicenter of life sciences, that fascinating world wasn't being covered by a serious standalone news organization. John had served on the board of the Massachusetts General Hospital and he knew brilliant people in biotech, robotics, medical education, and some of the most important labs in America. It was evident to him that some of the most compelling stories in life sciences weren't being covered at all or being covered only in a limited way. So I was intrigued by John's enthusiasm and perhaps what got my attention was the ability um, to have millions of dollars to invest in starting a, a uh, not a biotech, but a uh, news organization from scratch. But really what captured my attention was a meeting I had with the Life Sciences Association in Kendall Square, which as you all know, is the, the sort of biotech hub in Cambridge, Boston. I started asking questions about uh, biotech and I just remember just writing on scraps of paper. Uh, I couldn't write fast enough. There was just the fascinating world that there was there and the, the stories out there that I hadn't heard about that weren't being covered. Um, so I was sold on the spot just by hearing about the innovation going on. And I was so sold on it that when I first moved to Boston, I lived for a few months in Kendall Square because I just wanted to soak in the biotech ambiance there and sort of get to learn, learn it for myself. So I immediately started hiring, given that this wasn't my expertise, what we needed to do immediately is I needed to hire the very best people who covered these stories, these uh, this area for years. So I hired, um, you know, people like Ed Silverman, the Pharmalot columnist at the Wall Street Journal, Sharon Begley, who's one of the most respected science writers in the country, Adam Feuerstein, who's probably the best reporter covering the intersection of, of Wall Street and biotech, um, Damien Garday, the star, who was the star uh, reporter at Fierce Biotech, Later, we hired Matt Herper, the tremendously respected science writer at Forbes. And that's just part of our staff, but their mission um, has not been just to cover the biotech hub in Boston, but to cover the stories everywhere, including LA, which um, California, I think, is our top area of readers of all California, New York, um, because there's so much biotech, as you know, so much going on where you all are. Our LA-based reporter, Usha McFarland, has written compelling stories about the impact of COVID on the more vulnerable communities. Most recently, she wrote about how it's, COVID is complicating care for patients with sickle cell. Earlier this year, we added Jonathan Chan in Hong Kong, who writes a weekly China biotech newsletter. Our aim is for stories that, that have a, an appeal to readers like yourselves who have a deep knowledge of science and biotech, but also we want to be more interesting and entertaining and provocative and engaging than what you might find in, in academic or trade publications. We also have a daily biotech newsletter called The Readout by Damien Garday and uh, Megan Keshavan and a weekly a biotech, biotech podcast called The Readout Loud which features Damien Adam Feuerstein, and we just announced the other day, Meg, Meg Terrell from CNBC, um, who's joining us next week as co-host. And if you haven't listened to Read Out Loud, um, 
I suggest you download, listen to it. The hosts are, you don't even have to love biotech to enjoy it. The hosts are really smart and sharp and there's a great rapport there and it's just really a, a fun listen. Through these offerings, we've built up a passionate and devoted audience of readers who come to us for coverage of biotech. We've also covered, created annual programs to encourage the work that, that folks like yourselves um, are doing to advance science. Some of you probably have heard about our, our stat Wonderkins, which honors bright young minds in life sciences for their work in academia, industry, and in the clinic. This year's winners, and there's several from California, will be announced at our STAT Summit um, November 17th. Every March, we also have STAT Madness, which is a bracket-style tournament to find the best innovations in science and medicine. Um, and it's really inspiring to see universities and research institutions competing from all over North America with sending videos, sort of being very engaging on show, on social to sort of to open all of our eyes about all the great work that's being done around the country. But the, the biggest inflection point for us at STAT, and of course for all of us has been the pandemic, for all the, the, the misery, um, it's reminded the world of the importance of the science and all the important work you all are doing. It has also given us at STAT even more of a mission to leverage our journalists' expertise and knowledge to inform the public. We were one of the first news organizations to write about what became COVID. Um, Helen Branswell, our reporter, wrote her, she warned about it in a tweet, I think New Year's Eve, but she wrote her first story about uh, this mystery vi virus from China on January 4th. Um, and we've prided ourselves on sort of ever since then, having trying to be ahead of the curve in, in our coverage of not only the science of, of the of the virus, but the, the business um, of drug and vaccine development, um, as well as the politics of the pandemic response. We, we produce video explainers to bring the science to life, dashboards that track the virus, live chats, and we also have our first opinion op-ed section that's, that we've used as a worldwide forum for assorted perspectives on, on COVID. Also, as part of this, we've redoubled our efforts in covering um, race and medicine and science. Um, in September, we added a new reporter whose job it is exclusively to focus on those stories. Well, while the interest in science has exploded with COVID, it's not always easy for us as journalists to cover, you know, in, in terms of huge wrenching stories. I remember I was a reporter when 9-11 happened and every news organization would throw reporters on it. Everyone was covering 9-11. It was a sort of international, you know, moment there. But with COVID, it's, it's affecting the world, but you can't just throw a reporter on um, explaining how um, disease spreads, and you can't just throw a reporter on how drugs are developed. These are areas that, as you all know, take years of, of learning and expertise, and you can't, it's very hard to explain, you know, this latest turn in clinical trials on the, at the top of the evening news in, in 15 seconds. Um, so, um, so fortunately, we have reporters who spent years covering these, these issues. We write about the business impact of a blockbuster COVID drug or the ensuing stock market um, fluctuations, but we don't shy away from focusing on the sweeping implications of treatments, whether for patients or for the political landscape or the broader biopharma industry as a whole. We try our best to put um, drug trial results into context, whether casting doubt early on about hydrochloroquine or our scoops about Gilead's remdesivir. Um, one of the most notable things that, that sticks in my mind is when Moderna announced in a press release in May that it had very positive results from um, experimental trial. You, you might realize that the stocks rose and everyone was all excited, but our reporter Helen Branswell wrote what 
which she saw was a pretty routine story, which said, wait a minute, several vaccine experts say, you know, there's not sufficient data in their press release to know whether we should take this early readout with more than a grain of salt. And it wasn't like we were saying, this isn't reason to be excited, but we just, no one really knew one way or the other. So we want to sort of tell people don't get overly excited by a press release that doesn't have the data. And we were shocked when Helen was shocked. She thought I wrote a routine story that that story resulted in a $250 billion loss in stock value because suddenly people on Wall Street were saying, wait a minute, we figured we saw that press release. They didn't understand the science and they're buying and selling stocks just based on very little information. So we see it as our obligation when we have knowledgeable, authoritative reporters to inform the public about what's known and not known about these trials. We also have covered how the health tech industry has become a key player in the pandemic and how telemedicine use is soaring. Hospitals are turning to AI tools and the tech giants and small startups have launched efforts to screen patients and study the spread of the virus. All of you know as well as I do that for all your scientific knowledge, there are so many unknowns about COVID. So sort of our obligation is to write stories that offer transparency and not hype um, about what we know about coronavirus, its characteristics, how it spreads, what kind of illnesses it causes. But we also try to write about often as much as we can about what we don't know, about questions we have, because, you know, Tony Fauci doesn't have the answers, you know, and um, I remember uh, another early moment was when Tony Fauci, when Helen Branswell was um, moderating a panel in Washington of the Aspen Institute with Tony Fauci and a couple other people back in, I think it was either late February or March, and, um, and Fauci said, um, we don't need to worry right now. I'm not worried about a China, uh, the virus coming from China. And Helen interrupted and said, wait a minute, from everything I've reported and seen, this is a cause for real concern. And he said, I don't mean we shouldn't be concerned, but I mean, but he was, um, he was not as sure as Helen was in the moment. And I don't say that as, as, a, as a dig at, Tony Fauci, who's a brilliant guy whom we respect deeply and whom Helen respects deeply, but but it's it's to show that the science, there's so many unknowns, and part of what we see is our role as reporters is to sort of raising these questions and holding these public officials accountable as well as the companies accountable. For all the number, the numbers and debates hitting us nonstop about all this and the mask wearing and the politics. Um, one thing I just wanted to leave you all with that, that I think is very important that we don't get inured by the numbers um, because it's so, um, this is so serious. We are in, in the midst of a tragic reality. Thousands of people are dying every day. And it's, and sometimes, and we don't all wanna go around depressed all the time, but we've got to, we've got to reckon with that. This isn't disappearing. It's not going away. And um, the, um, this is sort of the, the, the personal stakes here were captured in a, in one of the most memorable pieces that I've read this year. And it's by um, one of our reporters, Eric Budman. And he wrote about a kitchen worker named Mary Deuce. Uh, Mary was 65 years old, and she was the first employee at a Brigham and Women's Hospital in, in Boston to die of COVID. And let me just read a little passage from Eric's piece. Uh, she, quote, she was a longtime germaphobe, years before the pandemic, years before the new coronavirus was known to exist. She always kept a stash of masks and Purell in her bag. She was never without paper towels to shield her hands from whatever unseen dangers lurked on doorknobs 
on handholds in the bus. She'd come home from the grocery store with Lysol, Pine Sol, ammonia, Clorox. She didn't just like the rooms tidy. She wanted them spotless and disaffected, disinfected. Yet Marie was the first person in this major hospital to die of COVID. Took all the precautions. And it shows you how vulnerable these frontline workers are. And um, the piece is a reminder of the ordinary people who are trying to create lives um, in America and are dying of COVID. But all of you, all of you here have a chance to help. Over the coming decades, many of the most important discoveries in the world will come out of biotech and life sciences. And all of you are poised to play a vital role. And I, I could not be, on behalf of STAT, I could not be more appreciative of all the important work and studies you are doing. And I thank you very much for coming today. I wanted to leave room to have a give and take and, and hear any of your questions, but thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so I would encourage uh, participants to uh, send questions in the Q&A, but we had during registration asked people to submit questions then also. So I have a, few, a, a short list here about that. So I can start with that. Uh, first off, I want to ask is your own experience covering as a reporter, you started off with politics and general news, and now you are running a biotech. So how has the experience been? Is it the same? Is it different when you are doing science versus when you're doing the general news or politics? I think it's, I think um, I approach it, on, on the one hand, you could argue that I approached it without knowing the field. But on the other hand, you could say I approached it with a totally fresh eye. Um, and so I could ask some of the questions that you all may think are, are dumb, but I think are sort of important in getting the big picture. Like, for example, um, um, you know, I asked um, our, one of our reporters, uh, uh, Sharon Bakley, why we keep hearing about Alzheimer's, why isn't there an Alzheimer's cure after 20 or 30 years? Why? Why are so many other diseases, we've made so much more progress. And she said, well, there's, you know, scientists will tell me there's a cabal where academics and industry and the government, everyone has gone veered in one direction and not been open-minded about the research. Um, and she said, there, there are reasons why we haven't made more progress with Alzheimer's. And I said, well, write that story, like talk to people, get that, Right, so she wrote an authoritative story that got a lot of attention that really laid out in the most authoritative way that anyone has done about where we are in Alzheimer's and why we're nowhere near a cure. And that's the kind of thing that like, I don't, I don't know the science, but I know the big questions to ask. And sometimes reporters who are living in the middle of this may not think to ask those step back questions because they're, they're immersed in the science and the daily um, grind of covering the stories. So I think, so, um, and I, I always think that uh, I'm so impressed with um, learning about the world of science and medicine. I've learned so much and I keep thinking, I'm never gonna know any of it. Like it's really hard stuff. But then I think about it and I think, you know, we have so many reporters on staff and no one has com has command of it all. Like our biotech people, um, like like with COVID, like like Adam Feuerstein knows the Wall Street and how that's reacting better than any reporter. But Helen Branswell understands the public health implications better than Adam does, and other people bring um, bring. Uh, sort of the patient side of it, like people like Eric Budman. So everyone comes at it with a different authority and expertise. And I think about um, all that I don't know, but then I think about all that I've learned in the last five or six years doing this. And it gives me great um, admiration 
for people in science and biotech and what you all are doing? That's, uh, that's awesome. And also, it's great that over the last few years, how biotech focused news organizations have come up, because I am a scientist myself, I don't have knowledge about the other things which other people do only about my field. One other question, uh, which came up uh, in, in the questionnaire, uh, which we sent out, um, was how do you ensure in this day and age, uh, how do you deal with uh, the idea of fake news? How do you ensure that you remain as one of the most uh, uh, reliable sources of news for your audiences? Well, I think first of all, we're, we're starting from a position of our stock and trade is like people with authority and who understand medicine and health and science. And so um, we try to stick to, um, to the science and not being political in any way. And if you're at a more general interest publication, like my former employee of the Times or Politico or something, it's by nature, you're going to cover more of the politics. So you're, um, and it's a very, as you all know, it's a very fraught, ex explosive world out there for the press um, and how people consume their information and how everything is so politicized. But, but there also is something that's, that's, that has affected us where uh, for the first time since I've seen it's hard to uncouple science right now from politics. Um, I, I mentioned 9-11 before, and I was a political reporter during 9-11, and um, I didn't have much to write about because everyone was getting along so well, Republicans, Democrats, we were all in it together to fight the terrorists, at least at the beginning. And when this tragedy happened, it's totally different, but I also thought, naively that this would be a time for the world to come together. We have a common enemy and it's this disease, let's work together. But instead you had the politics around everything about mask wearing and the CDC and who's running what and the governors and blaming people and pointing fingers. And um, so it's impossible to separate the politics now from the science. And we do the best we can to um, to to be straight and fair about what's going on, but you can't fairly, in my view, write about. Um, we wrote a piece very early on about that um, rose garden ceremony that was like a super spreader event. Like we wrote about it very quickly um, after uh, the president said he had COVID because it was sort of an obvious public health thing. And we weren't doing it pointing the finger as much as saying this was, this violated a lot of public health standards. Um, and some might say, well, why are you picking on the White House? Why are you picking on Republicans? To me, that's not a political story. That's a public health story where if people are spreading, um, disease, we need to write about it. If people aren't wearing masks and the CDC's recommendation and Tony Fauci's recommendation is that people wear masks, we have to write about that. So, but unfortunately, um, so when you ask about fake news, we might get accused sometimes even stat of, of fake news or why are you picking on one party or, or another when we're just trying to to, to write about with transparency, write about what's going on with this disease. Uh, yeah, definitely. And for me, uh, a lot of the news organizations where you have worked are have always been the go-to, you know, New York Times, Politico, uh, those are my go-to sources. So I completely trust them. And it's surprising that now they are becoming, the, people are raising doubts when they are decades old. Uh, the other question, uh, that we have is about Operation Warp Speed. In your outlook, how, how well do you think the FDA and other organizations did by cutting the red tape and really accelerating the process of uh, getting, you know, vaccines are now in phase three trials? So in your 
view how well did the red tape was cut to accelerate the process? Yeah, I think Operation Warp Speed, from what I can tell and what we've written, I think uh, should be commended in many ways for uh, for sort of the all-in sort of Manhattan project to try to move fast on this. So I think uh, I think it's all positive in many ways, and there's a lot of momentum. We just had a story this past a few days ago by uh, Nicholas Florco was really interesting about warp speed because it said um, there's an interesting conundrum because many Democrats, and this gets into the politics, many Democrats see the head of Operation Warp Speed as being uh, a flawed leader because he has personal interests in some of, in at least one of these companies. And there's a lot of controversy around the head of Operation Warp Speed, yet, and the question in this story is, if were Biden to become president, would he would he put a new person in charge of Warp Speed? And that's a really um, uh, sensitive question because on the one hand, there's a lot of uh, Democrats who say this guy is a flawed guy. On the other hand, you don't want to change horses in the middle of a pandemic. And the same story that raised these people questioning about um, about his leadership also said other like people that we talked to in public health and science said he's the perfect leader because he's had experience doing emergency vaccines he's had he knows the science he knows the subject so i mean i think that's an example of our being fair in raising all the all the sides of the story um on the one hand we quoted people saying the warp speed, the head of warp speed is amazing scientists and other people saying, yeah, but he's flawed politically with business things. And we just kind of lay it out there. But if you, but for you to ask me just broadly speaking about warp speed from, from what my uh, reporters say, um, it's, it seems to be all on the right track. We've had we, we had a piece a couple of weeks ago with our reporters saying, and I, again, at my asking the questions that come from me is with a fresh eye, I said, what's good and bad about warp speed? What do we like, what we don't like? And we had like six or seven points that were really interesting where our reporters said, there's a lot of good here, but here's back to what I was saying about, we don't know everything. Here are the questions we have. Here are the unknowns about warp speed. Yeah, uh, so I have a question. I'm going to rephrase a it a little bit. Um, we, the biotech industry, the FDA, the CDC was not in this limelight before the pandemic. So people were not even thinking that much about how politics is related to these institutes. Has the pandemic changed the influence on politics? Uh, or is it just, it's visible now? Uh, or so what, was this always been there? Or it's, it's a new thing? Well, I think it's really kind of an interesting question. It's an interesting thing to look at because you're right. These There's much more um, uh, discussion in the public about the FDA and the CDC and so forth. But, um, but all this talk of sort of government uh, leadership and agencies involved in health and science medicine are now... Uh, sort of overshadowed and maybe tainted by the politics. So now, um, now these agencies that always stood as sort of semi-independent and not touched by politics are becoming political, are, are talking points in the campaigns. And that's uh, troubling. Um, and the CDC, as you said, is sort of emerging as more front and center, but the reality is the CDC has been given sort of a back seat to, during this whole pandemic and the whole tradition of the CDC during uh, during Ebola and swine flu and everything is to be front and center and have press conferences every day. And our reporters are really alarmed that uh, the CDC has been sort of sidelined throughout this pandemic and uh, hasn't had the uh, the ability to warn the public or be 
out there for the public. So in some ways you say some of these agencies have raised their profile, but in other ways they're not able to do their jobs and they're tainted by the science. And now you have the FDA commissioner with these emergency authorizations. It's turned political where people are saying, um, is, is it right to fast track some of these clinical trials and some of the, this drug development? And so you have, um, so I guess my concern right now is you've raised the profile and the awareness of some of these agencies, but also they're much more tainted by politics than ever before. And I'm a little worried that in the future, people may not see uh, the NIH or the FDA or the CDC as more sort of neutrally political, non-political scientific entities. Yeah. Uh, so I have a very interesting question, and it's it's that how can science and biotech be more impactful? It, how can it reach more audiences or more people's daily lives you, to the non-scientists? How can uh, the science reach to them? I think I think it already is because of the pandemic, and tragically as that is, I think everyone um, um, is more a little more aware and knowledgeable about the world that that all of you are in like suddenly like people didn't know anything about vaccines or uh, emergency authorizations or clinical trials or testing any of these the lingo or anything people didn't um didn't weren't that interested but i think because it's touching all of our lives in this very um sort of alarming way I think uh, there's going to be an awareness, there is an awareness, right or wrong, about science that's going to change the public's understanding forever. I hope it's not tainted too much by the politics, and I hope people come away, at least if there's a good thing from this, people understanding the importance of science and, and how all drug development works and how you can't just snap your fingers and get a cure for something. You can't just snap your fingers and get a vaccine. As, as we know, there's still no, no, the, there's no vaccine for AIDS still yet. We still know that, um, you know, these things are complicated. Even if we get a vaccine for COVID, that doesn't mean it's a hundred percent effective and and it's not a magical thing plus you have the distribution issues you have um uh, can people get re reinfected there's so many questions and so many answers we don't know but i generally think if you did a sur survey of people's understanding of science i think it's it's going up definitely so um not to take too much of your time, I'll just ask two final questions. One is from the audience, which says, Peter Marks from the FDA mentioned that the vaccine effective rate now is 30 to 50%. This is typically seen as a low effective rate. Do you have any remarks related to this? Um, I'm afraid I'm going to um, bow out of answering that because I'd rather, that's the kind of question I would, I would ask my colleagues like Helen Branswell to answer. And I don't feel like, I know they talked, I know all my reporters talked to Peter Marks all the time and sort of would know inside out, but but I'm not gonna, um, but, but I don't feel frankly authoritative enough to talk about that specifically. So this last question, and I always like asking this to all the speakers we invite at BCLA, we've had a very uh, difficult year, a very uh, negative, you know, like, <clears throat> Uh, year, what are you optimistic about in the future when it comes to healthcare, biotech, and the general in the, the general uh, life uh, forward? What are you optimistic about? Um, I I think that's a great way to end to on a happy note um, because um, you know we can't all be as much as we need to be aware of. The reality this is like we're in a war and people are dying and we can't forget that um we also have to um protect ourselves and our own mental health and our own we're all under such intense stress even those of us who are lucky enough to have our health and have jobs and so forth this is 
um, causing, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be studying this for years, the untold stress this is having on everyone, every single human being. Um, and I think um, one of the, the positive um, results of this is if you can find a, a silver lining is sort of what, what I was talking about before is the people having an understanding of the importance of real science and of what people in science do and what the role of biopharma is. And I think, so I think everyone at this conference who's listening here and watching should, should feel proud that this is your moment to, um, this is, the, the world is watching and for years hence, people now are much more aware of what you can do to help every human being. And I think, um, and the another sort of thing to be optimistic about as, as tough as it's been in um, seeing the vulnerable communities and um, the inequities in healthcare uh, that are going on and it's tragic, but I think we're also seeing through this pandemic and through all the, 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 the protests and the unrest we've seen, we're seeing finally a recognition of, of these inequities and people are paying, I think, more attention to it. And I think, um, <coughs> um, I think um, we, um, like when I mentioned that we have a, uh, a reporter now on sort of race and science, I mean, we, it's not just one reporter. We we have we do a lot of coverage of that, and we've always have, but it's never been enough. And I think um, I feel proud that I and I wish I had thought of it years ago. That we're we're there's a recognition of how important these issues are. So I think um, so I think this whole pandemic. The positive thing is we're we're seeing these inequities that have happened over the years. We're 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 it's a stark sort of wake up call of what's happening in in the world. And the, the other thing that I hope with science is um, the the import of one thing we've seen since I've seen since it's st at STAT is that there's um, a very, uh, there's a, been a lack of diversity in, in leadership in life sciences. And we did a, a story that was sort of the talk of the JP Morgan conference a few years ago when we said there were more men named Mike on stage doing panels at JP Morgan than all the women combined at, at speaking at JP Morgan. And there's been a, a lack of, of diversity in science. And I'm optimistic that that's changing now with the higher profile of what we're seeing happening in with with COVID, and um, so so overall, you know, it's hard to find a silver lining. But I do think this uh, this is an opportunity for all of us for for um, for you you guys in science to uh, to bring what you do to help help the public. And frankly, for stat, for someone like Stat, for journalists like me, I'm sort of proud of what we've been able to do because. Um, you know, we were doing fine before COVID and, but suddenly because of what's happened, we, as you mentioned at the outset, we literally have millions more readers coming to us because they want to understand the science and they want to know what's going on. And I feel like we've had a mission and a role that's been positive to sort of inform and uh, try not to be political about what's going on. So I think for I think that's why we all share this together in terms of our role in helping the public and informing the public. And I think that's a positive thing. Definitely, a lot of uh, bad news, but always something to be positive about. Yeah. Um, on that note, I would really like to thank you again for joining us, and also want to mention to the audience that. Rick has been gracious enough to provide an, a discount code for the registrations of this event, uh, which was sent out to everyone. So thank you so much, uh, Rick, uh, for joining us again today. Thank you. And si since you mentioned that thing, I just want to mention 
just so you all know, most of our dad is free, like our readout newsletter, our every morning, our biotech newsletter, read out loud. And the code that we've done for you all, the special code is a 75% um, discount to an annual subscription for our stat plus, which is uh, gives you access to all of our sort of exclusive real deep biotech uh, stories and our events and so forth. And we want to make it accessible to, it's normally, it's not cheap, but we want to make it accessible, particularly to students and postdocs and people like that. So that's why, like, I don't want you all to feel you can't read everything we do because it's expensive. So that's why we, I'm hoping some of you can take advantage of that. But, and thank you again for, for including me um, and for reading STAT. Absolutely. Thank you so much.